Well, welcome everybody. Um, uh, really happy to have you here today. Um, my name is Eric Sundquist. I'm the director of SSTI. Um, we'll introduce what SSTI is a little bit more in just a second, but I'm going to, I'm talking a little slowly. I'm vamping just a bit because I can see people joining us. Um, and I want to go a little slow and give everybody a chance to get in out of the waiting room. So I'll give it just another second or two. All right. Well, so people will join in progress. Um, again, Eric Sundquist, director of SSTI, uh, welcoming everybody to the, the final um, session of our virtual community of practice this year. Um, SSTI is a joint project of University of Wisconsin and Smart Growth America. Been around for about 10 years. So one of the main things that we do is run a peer network, which is you are now experiencing. We do these meetings usually in person where people get a chance to share best practices and ask questions and share struggles and challenges and successes um, with each other. Um, and we have had um, several meetings already this fall. This is the last session. The rest of them, the two of the others, one was on, on COVID and what it means for the future of transportation in terms of telework and, and other forms of not work. Um, and then one on, um, on um, anti-racism and equity. Both of those are recorded and on our website at ssti.us. Uh, we also had a private meeting for the DOT CEOs uh, where they were able to discuss, um, you know, what I just said, um, struggles, challenges, mutual interests. Um, so we're always interested in working with, with folks. If you want to, if this meeting or anything you see on our website st strikes your interest, please reach out. We'd love to collaborate. And sometimes we have funding to help and sometimes we don't, but um, we're always interested in folks uh, working with us. So we do a lot of technical assistance. We do research. Um, being at a university, our research tends to be hands-on and moving um, good concepts into practice rather than sort of more ivory tower esoterica. Um, so if that is appealing to you, again, reach out. And then we do publish a whole bunch of stuff, um, uh, and, which we put on the website, um, good reports that we would, we think are best practices and may be um, useful to you too. So that's who we are. Um, our discussion today uh, around VMT, which we'll get into in just a second, is really meant to be a discussion. Um, so we have two top-notch leaders here who are going to lead us in the discussion and make some introductory remarks. Don Andre, who is Deputy Chief of Staff with um, um, Representative uh, Chuy Garcia from the great state of Illinois, just to our south here. Um, and Ellen Greenberg, who's Deputy Director for Sustainability at Caltrans. And they will, um, after I desist in a minute, they will um, maybe introduce themselves a little bit more in their interest in this and then say a few words. And then we really do want to have, a, have folks participate. We had about 75 people sign up for this. So it can't quite be like a, you know, an office Zoom meeting where everybody jumps in. So we need to structure it a little bit. So if you would just put something in the chat if you want to, to ask a question and then we'll call on you and, and it could be a comment. You may have some thoughts that we haven't, we haven't, uh, that hasn't occurred to us. So we wanna make it a real participatory experience here and not just a, a, a webinar. Um, it will be recorded and all the, like the other recordings will be available at ssti.us again send you to our web website. Um, so let me introduce the topic just a bit. Um, when we got started with SSTI about 10 years ago, um, we did a series of meetings with DOTs around the country just to see if we built it, would people come? Are they interested in talking about sustainability and better governance and, you know, modernizing, whatever you want to call it, reform within the in the transportation sector? And um, the answer was yes, which was good. And then we, we went down a little bit into the, you know, 
what people were already doing or what they were proud of. And if you remember 10, 12 years ago was when the field was really moving toward performance measures. Performance measures were, you know, pretty in business and other fields had been around for a long time, but in transportation, it was still kind of novel. And so we were running around trying to think of, you know, what should we put on our dashboard and um, what should the federal government require us to measure and, you know, what happens if we don't meet our targets and things like that. And lo and behold, it turned out that more than one DOT had VMT on their dashboard or whatever performance measure list they had, whatever, however they called it. And at first glance, we thought, well, that, that's great. That's, you know, kind of surprising and great. Um, but then we looked at it a little closer and they, the directionality of the goal was up in those cases. They wanted more VMT. And when we asked them, they said, well, that's because, you know, the more people drive, the more they're using our facilities and they're enjoying it. And oh, by the way, our revenue goes up. So more VMT, good. And we, so we, we said, well, you know, real people may disagree that more traffic is good and more emissions are good. And so, so, you, so there's been a change in the last uh, 10 years. You don't see that so much anymore. I don't know that there isn't a view, uh, some agency that still does that, but now there's become an, a, an interest in actually reining in BMT as the title of today's uh, discussion calls it. And um, a lot of that is driven by greenhouse gas and climate and our goals. Not all, because there's other good reasons around livability and placemaking, um, safety and all, all kinds of other outcomes that we would rather have less traffic rather than more. But GHG is, I'm just gonna touch on GHG as a, as a major motivating factor here. As most of us on this call probably are aware by now, transportation is now the leading sector for GHG uh, in the country. Um, and it's as the others, particularly electricity is shrinking, transportation is still growing. Um, this is, um, comparison showing VMT over the years since 1990 um, in GHG. And you could see that um, things are getting a little cleaner because of cafe standards and more efficient vehicles, um, maybe some fuel switching, um, you know, vehicles and fuels have improved, but, but VMT hasn't, has, has slowed its increase, but has, is still increasing. And you can see that you know, that means that our line for GHG from surface transportation continues to increase too. And this is in contrast to the electric sector, um, which has actually bent the curve. It is not just flattened it, it's reducing. Um, and if you think about the electric sector, there are a lot of things going on there. Um, very prominently, it has been switching away from coal to largely natural gas, which is somewhat cleaner, but still emits fossil fuel or uh, uh, GHG. Uh, also to renewables to some extent, but also they have worked really hard on efficiency and megawatts. So utilities, big utilities uh, around the country have been pushed by the regulators or if they're, if they're a co-op or they're municipally owned by their stakeholders to help insulate houses and promote efficiency in other ways um, that um, have helped bend the curve that we really haven't done as much in transportation. So when you, coming now to the end of my introductory remarks, um, if you assume that this is a problem, and I hope I've convinced you if you didn't believe it already, um, in transportation that VMT continues to grow and that the DOTs are now interested in trying to deal with it, they're kind of like utilities were back several decades ago where they're, they're being pushed into doing megawatts and like asking, well, how do we do that? That's not been part of our business model. That's not been part of our plan. We've always been trying to supply stuff. If the city grows, we build another plant, you know, or people use more electricity, we, we burn more coal. That's what we've been doing. And that's what we've been doing in transportation. We've been trying to, to meet the supply or the needs by increasing supply. Um, and now we need a, a new way to think about it. it, but we don't really have those tools um, or we don't have them. They're not taught in class in engineering or planning school. They're not in a lot of our manuals. 
until now. And so that's what's really exciting. Um, I am going to shut up and we're going to hear from our speakers um, because in California, uh, we do now have some good guidance on, on what drives VMT and how to look at projects and programs and think about VMT. And at the federal level, we do have new interest in policy around these things that are that isn't just like how much money should we move from one bucket to another, which is what we typically get. Um, we have, so, so uh, with that, I am going to be quiet. I am going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Ellen first because she's on my screen first. So Ellen, uh, Ellen Greenberg from Caltrans, please take it away. And I believe you want to share it. There you go. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And now I wait to be told I'm on mute. Nope. You're good. Whoa. Amazing. Good start to the day. So actually, I had a really good start to the day, better even than not being on mute, because I had a 6 a.m. walk and I got to see this gorgeous sunrise uh, that I've uh, put on my first slide as a way to make PowerPoint more welcoming. Um, but I, I have noticed these days everybody can use a moment to take a deep breath every day, all the time. So look at the picture, take a deep breath. We'll start that way. So with thanks to Eric, um, I'm Ellen Greenberg. I'm the Deputy Director for Sustainability at the California Department of Transportation, Caltrans. And in fact, today is my four year anniversary in the department. Um, and well, <laughs> who, who would have thought? Um, so. Uh, some of you I may have crossed paths with before. Most of my career uh, was spent in consulting with uh, a few years in the nonprofit sector. So this is, has been a big change and a very satisfying four years. And we've also had a lot of transition in, in department and agency leadership during this time. And the changes that I'm going to be talking about started uh, in earlier administrations and are very much uh, focus uh, at the moment of both the current uh, administration led by Gav Gavin Newsom, the governor, uh, but also at the level of department leadership and leadership at the California State Transportation Agency. So um, Eric was commenting, you know, a little bit like, you know, this is, this is about change. And I think the comparison to the utilities is really very apt, because if we think about the fact that over time, you know, utilities have essentially become conservation organizations, right? As it got harder and harder and harder to build additional uh, power generating capacity in much of the country, uh, you know, our utilities have in many cases switched over to encouraging conservation from encouraging consumption. Um, so there really is a very, a very strong parallel. Um, I think that for the, the big change really, I think in my organization is um, for the, the DOT to take on the idea uh, that the role of a DOT is something other than satisfying travel demand. And, you know, historic, so very comparable again to the utilities, you know, historically, it's like people want to drive and we're building roads. And now we're trying to really elevate things to a level where there's an appreciation that what we build, how we build, where we build it, how we design it actually influences how people decide to travel. And that is very, very new and different. So that's another kind of core piece of what we're going to be talking about. Okay, so let's see if I can. Sorry, there goes the sunrise. Um, so this is a pretty short set of slides. It's a relatively complicated story that I'm going to try to to tell in uh, 15 or so quick quick slides. And there's a lot of material online about this program. So uh, you know, I'll direct everybody to our website. There are recorded webinars that you know just you'll just have a great time. So if you feel like you want more details, you'll be able to find that. So importantly, uh, we're talking about implementation of a, a 2013 California Senate bill, SB 743. And that is, has been the focus of a shift to the use of vehicle miles traveled as a measure of transportation impact in the state. 
CEQA is our environmental law, the California Environmental Quality Act. You know, in California, babies learn this language. Um, you know, this is in, in our blood. So CEQA is our environmental law, and we are shifting to pay more attention to VMT kind of through the vehicle of our environmental review process. And in 2013, the passage of SB 743 kind of created a better alignment between our environmental law and our state climate and planning goals through the way it addressed transportation and infill development. So this law changed the way our environmental process analyzes transportation impacts, both in connection with land development projects and infrastructure projects. And I'm gonna be focusing on the conversation about infrastructure projects and the changes there, because that's really like much more directly in the DOT wheelhouse. Um, after the statute, our environmental law is amended, that's followed by regulatory amendments, which are embodied in the CEQA guidelines. And what I just want to highlight here is the bill was passed in 2013, as you'll see in that top bullet, and um, the guidelines were amended in late 2018. And that five-year period is a reflection of the challenges associated with implementation of this shift. So I don't want to downplay uh, that <laughs> this has been a, a tricky path. And the department launched guidance to implement this this summer, and we're now just starting our, uh, our implementation era, as it were. So we have two focuses for implementing this bill. We do have a role in land use projects, and it's an advisory role. We evaluate the way land use projects have been assessed by local governments. And we have a program called Local Development Intergovernmental Review. So that's on the land use side. On the transportation side, uh, we conduct with partners uh, the evaluation of proposed investments on the state highway system. So this is where that idea that our investments influence how people travel, this is where that, that's played out. So all of this work, you know, it's very easy for folks to get in the weeds on this and, and to, to kind of obsess about the how and the why and the details of the bill and the which projects are and aren't involved. And uh, we try consistently to keep an eye on, you know, the why we're doing this in terms of the policy objectives. So, you know, we're looking at our transportation improvements to understand if they're really getting us towards our broader aims uh, for accessibility, for communities, et cetera. We are uh, very much focused on the way that we can advance the state's progress towards our climate targets um, and at the same time address the housing crisis in the state. So these things, you know, are very often in tension, it's in tension with one another. This is, again, a challenge. Um, and then these individual aims are all within the broader uh, approach to environmental protection that's implemented through the California Environmental Quality Act through our environmental review process. Um, so this uh, rather wordy slide is kind of emphasizing that. One thing I'll highlight is this bottom line, which is a phrase that one of our colleagues came up with that I have found extremely useful. We're rethinking our investments so people can drive less. Um, so it's not so much about, you know, we're not here to take away your car, we're here to uh, make the state a place where people have the opportunity to live their lives and people have the opportunity to run their businesses without so much uh, driving being required, really. So uh, the climate piece is a very substantial piece of why we're focused on VMT and helpful to put that in the framework of the state's um, mobile source reduction strategy, which is packaged in our 2017 scoping plan which is the state's plan for meeting our greenhouse gas reduction targets. And a lot of you may have heard recently about the governor's executive order on zero emission vehicles, uh, EO 7920. So this is yet another source of confusion. You know, aren't electric vehicles gonna save us? Sorry, no, but are they gonna help us? Yes. So the three parts of the mobile source strategy are increasing zero emission vehicle use, converting to cleaner fuels in conventional vehicles and reducing vehicle miles traveled. So we have that, you know, three-legged stool as, as it were, 
And that one part, the reducing vehicle miles traveled, is the focus of SB 743 use changes to our environmental law. Uh, my, my pie is different than Eric's pie. Important to note. So in California, the transportation related greenhouse gas emissions are a bigger share, substantially bigger share than, na than nationally, because you know, we've been regulating um, air pollution impacts and emissions impacts of industry for so long. We have been working on uh, increasing the proportion of renewables in the energy grid for so long. So transportation is, is the big remaining challenge ahead of us. And when you combine uh, the direct emissions from tailpipes with emissions associated with petroleum refining and other industrial processes, it's actually about half of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state that are associated with the transportation sector. But it is um, a challenge, I would say, that we haven't done a good enough job with yet, um, that we need to keep communicating that this is not just about greenhouse gas emissions. You know, even if we had an emission-free uh, car for every driver, uh, we would not, re we still wouldn't, wouldn't be, um, you know, blind to the impacts of VMT, right? So VMT has these other impacts, obviously a primary contributor to traffic congestion, um, public health impacts, and um, impacts around growth inducement and land consumption. And then the final point there um, is that we cannot afford to maintain an ever-growing system. So the idea that, you know, we have a number of revenue sources that are dedicated to new investment is at odds with the actual availability of ongoing revenue to support a larger system. So increasingly, that's part of our messaging as well. You know, the system is largely mature and managing and taking care of that system are really uh, primary priorities. Okay, so we have produced uh, in the last year a set of guidance materials, and these are available online for people who really like to dig deep. Um, and the two key elements associated with transportation project analysis are something called the TAF, or Transportation Analysis Framework, and something called the TAC, or Transportation Analysis under CEQA. And Eric was commenting about tools and I will say the tools are in an early stage. So, you know, we are challenged. Like, we know what we want to do. We know what we want to measure. But the challenges of measuring continue. And, and I'll provide just a few quick details. So here's one of the big, big changes um, is that SB 743 explicitly eliminated the use of level of service as a way of measuring delay as a transportation impact associated with land development projects. So folks could no longer um, use, you know, traffic at an intersection adjoining a new development project as a basis for denying that project. In, so vehicle miles traveled is not just being introduced, but it's replacing that earlier metric. And that requirement is explicit, was explicit in the law in connection with uh, development projects, and, and it was presented as an option in connection with transportation projects, and Caltrans has uh, made the decision to uh, follow the lead of what's in the guidance on land development projects and use that same metric for transportation projects. And the particular focus of transportation project analysis is on induced demand, and this is really a very new concept um, for lots of folks in the department, which is the idea that when we add capacity to the system, there is a behavioral response by drivers, which essentially um, results in additional travel. Longer trips in some cases, different trips in some cases, but most importantly, new trips that otherwise might not have been made. And that that phenomenon is uh, the induced travel phenomenon is also referred to as traffic attributable to the project. That's what we're interested in. And that is generally a result of additional capacity. So what that leads us to is addressing certain types of projects that add capacity to the system. These are the projects that are affected by these changes because they're likely to lead to a measurable and substantial increase in vehicle travel. And if this language seems 
uh, tortured, it's because this is the statutory or the legal language, measurable or substantial increases. So the focus of this change is on how we look at capacity increasing projects. Importantly, there are many, many, many project types that are not affected and uh, you know, we go to great pains to assure people who are most interested in rehabilitation, maintenance, paving, safety projects, that those projects are not affected. So we're really looking at um, the question of what kinds of projects will lead to this behavioral change that stimulates additional travel. Um, and this change has been formalized in a uh, memorandum from myself and the deputy director for project delivery, who's our department chief engineer. And I, I'm showing this to say this is this is very much a formal policy on the depart, part of the department. So this um, this two-sided challenge of bringing policy to address this and bringing tools to address this. Like in my view, it's kind of a, a circle, hopefully a virtuous cycle. Um, you know, our policy says we need this, our tools say we can kind of do it. And now because we have a strong policy, we need to keep working to make our tools stronger. So the TAP and TAC are the two documents that reflect this, you know, really a major shift in interpreting how we look at transportation impacts, how we analyze them and mitigate them. Um, both of the documents, so they're, they're relatively short documents, they're not like great big tomes, um, and both of them have the, this flow chart included that shows the relationship between the two. And you don't have to study this, I'm just going to make this point that um, the, the analysis of vehicle miles traveled is approached just like other resource analyses in our environmental documents. And one of the documents, the TAC, just goes through the steps in the process and says, well, how do we look at transportation? And then there's a point in that process, which is this diamond screening step, at which you say, well, is this project a project that is going to um, have the potential to cause additional travel? And if it is, then you refer to the other document and the other document will walk you through the steps of that analysis. Now here's where I'm going to kind of follow up a little further on the question of tools. Um, and I totally appreciate it. Eric is like basically my biggest fan and you know it's good to have a fan when you're doing something hard. Um, this has been a, a, a real challenge. So I, all of you I'm sure on the line are familiar with uh, the reliance that our agencies, our regional planning agencies, our state agencies have on travel demand modeling in its various forms from the traditional four-step model to, you know, more recent activity-based models that some of us have. This phenomenon we're interested in, the phenomenon of induced travel, is generally not recognized by our modeling tools. And that's uh, an enormous challenge for us because so many of our processes are reliant on using models. So saying we're now interested in this other phenomenon and our models aren't quite up to it creates, you know, really a lot of disruption in the system that we're trying to work through. So a key tool that is built into our process is the use of uh, elasticities uh, which draw on research that has actually measured changes in travel um, and measured them in a way that isolates the effect of capacity increases. And the National Center for Sustainable Transportation at the University of California at Davis has produced an online calculator that calculates induced travel effects. And that calculator is one of the tools that's built into our process but it is um, limited in terms of the geographic locations and the facility types to which it applies. So I'm just gonna wrap up and then we can hear from Don and, and have conversation and I'm sorry to take so long, but it is a complicated situation. So um, from an agency point of view, I thought folks would be interested in seeing the way that we've organized our effort. And uh, this is uh, something that I have used consistently internally, you know, to, to brief the director, to brief the secretary, um, folks who are not involved on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, one of my approaches is like, I always have to have a visual that fits on one page that I can put in front of our executive team and say, here's the hole and here's where we are now, right? So, um, 
And this actually has evolved. I try not to let the picture change because that unnerves people. So it's always, you know, blue lozenges, but the, the inside of the lozenges changes somewhat. So in this first uh, phase, phase one, I wanted to remind people that we've actually been in this work for a while. And the department had a 2015 strategic management plan that included a VMT reduction objective, a reduction objective, but it was not really acted on and it wasn't really bought into. Um, but, I, but it's always helpful to remind folks that yes, this isn't the first time we've ever touched on it. So, um, but this has been the work of the last, say, 16 to 18 months, the compliance activities, and we started with the production of those documents. So that's complete. We've completed 2.1, and we're now engaged in 2.2, which is supporting our teams that are actually producing these documents and supporting our partner agencies. Um, a very important piece that we're also uh, working on currently is looking at mitigation because our environmental law very much um, emphasizes the opportunity to mitigate impacts so project can be um, can move forward and a lot of questions about how to mitigate VMT, how to analyze the potential effectiveness of mitigation strategies and the opportunity to use some kind of mitigation mechanisms like VMT banks or exchanges. So that's our third phase. Our fourth set phase is what we're calling strategic change. And we're already engaged in these conversations, which is saying, okay, well, if we're changing what we invest in, what we invest in, and we want people to be able to drive less, then what are we gonna invest in? What's the positive side of this change? It's not just about what we're not doing. It has to also be about what we are doing. And you know what direction are we facing in, and how do we make that real in terms of our programming and prioritizing decisions? Um, and then obviously ongoing implementation and monitoring. And then through all that, uh, there's been a very high level of partner and stakeholder engagement uh, and messaging and communication around these themes. Um, so this is what we're doing right now. This focus on compliance support. Um, addressing technical and procedural issues on specific projects, training of our staff. So our, we have a 20,000 person organization. They don't all need to learn this, but there are a lot of people that need to learn this. So the training and engagement of our own folks, as well as our, our partners, other transportation agencies, is a huge lift. And then technical support to our project development teams um, as they're grappling with the application of this new process and specific uh, opportunities. That's it. Okay, so the best way to get, all, get to all that other information is just go to our uh, Caltrans homepage, dot.ca.gov, and just search SB 743, and the first link you come to uh, will be the page with a whole lot more. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. And we will also link to that with our, where we have the recording. So if it'll all be in one place. And I can recommend to you as um, actually great reading the, at least the TAF. I haven't spent as much time in the TAC, but the transportation analysis framework that goes into the kind of stuff that we're interested in SSTI is like, how do you actually quantify um, or attempt to quantify VMT impacts from induced demand and stuff like that. It is so well written. Um, it is well accessible to people who are have never heard of a four-step model or you know what have you. And um, so you're so I really recommend that to you. And I um, so thank you, Ellen. And I just the, the one you know you know you mentioned the the um, we'll get into questions later. I want people to start thinking about them and start dropping them in the chat, but you mentioned the messaging and so forth, and you, you had your, the bit about allowing people to drive less. Um, we sometimes say drive less, enjoy more, or allow people to be operationalized a little bit to make sure it's, people are clear. We're not just talking about making everybody into strap hangers, that it's allowing people to meet their needs with fewer and shorter car trips. They may still drive, but maybe not as far or maybe not as often. So yeah, that's the spirit of, of the MT reduction. Um, so with that, uh, let's jump in our Zoom hyperloop and travel across the country very quickly to Washington and um, to Don, who is, is back in the office 
today as um, our lawmakers <laughs> are reconvening. Um, Don. Yeah, so hey everyone, Eric, thank you so much. And Ellen, thank you so much. Uh, Ellen's the real expert here in the room as well as everyone else on the Zoom. And I, I always make that joke when we have briefings um, that really in Congress, uh, we're policymakers, but that is far away from the same definition as being experts. And so we really rely on think tanks, our DOTs, and folks across the country. So uh, again, my name is Don Andres. I am Congressman Tui Garcia's Legislative Director and Deputy Chief. Um, and the Congressman hails from uh, the uh, city of Chicago, uh, full of transit, full of traffic woes, and all of all the good things that come from urban sprawl. Um, but I will, you know, I'll just start off by saying that it's so great to hear the incredible work that happens in our state DOTs, the experts, uh, the planners, the engineers. And I think what often gets left out of the message is um, how does the federal government play a role? How does Congress sort of play into that role? And the really, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the reality is there's good news and bad news. But the bad news is, is that the level of depth of knowledge that one would hope that many, even folks I used to work with back in the city of Los Angeles when I worked for then city council president, Eric Garcetti is that there's this hope that everyone at the government, at the federal level knows what's going on, is thinking about what the next step is. And one, that's some of what happens at the DOT, but it's certainly not really what's happening at a large scale in the, uh, in the Congress. When I think about just in the House Transportation Committee, I'm talking about maybe 25 staffers, some of whom do comms, some do policy, some focus on rail and aviation. And so you really get this really small subset of experts, uh, and then you get 435 members and their staff trying to figure out what happens next. And I think I want to start from this point just to level the sort of the, the baseline in that transportation, because it tends to focus on funding and funding formulas that have existed for quite some time, you rarely see a discussion about policy and you you see tweaking around the edges of this word or that word and you'll see most of the discussion about as eric noted earlier about the total amounts of funding how much money how much general fund money do we need to move over because the highway trust fund was short this year and that's the kind of discussion we have and we have it about every five years uh, ideally sometimes we do short term versions actually that's been more um more common but what ends up happening in these pre-baked, large, massive, multi-billion dollar bills is that there's not enough staff expertise to really understand what is even in the bill, other than the top line number. Folks don't understand what is level of service or what, even, even the basics. I would actually say that half of the members of Congress don't understand what VMT stands for or GHG stands for, unless you say it out loud. Um, and so I think really starting that baseline. And then the last piece I'll add on this is that because of that, because of this trend of being formulaic, uh, transportation tends to be a um, entry level issue area. So we cover everything from immigration to, um, to criminal justice reform. This happens to be an issue that so infrequently comes to the table of members of Congress in a real debate that it tends to be the kind of position that's handed over to someone who also does the letters for correspondence. Not that those aren't important, but it is really, that's sort of the reason why my boss launched the Future Transportation Caucus, which is that we realized there was a massive gap of understanding and depth of knowledge to even have a baseline discussion of what is VMT? What could we do better in transportation? What are the outcomes we hope to achieve? And how do we even get there if all we can talk about is, is the Highway Trust Fund? Is, is, there enough, is there enough money? And now you'll see that we've actually moved in the direction Folks have started to think more because voices are loud in the climate space. And Ellen, you, you touched on this. And that is, folks are starting to understand that transportation has a huge effect on our climate crisis. And we need to start focusing on that. Um, and what you've seen is a lot of the organizations on the outside, especially folks like Sierra Club, League of Conservation, our, our, a lot of our friends in the environmental space have, in the last five to 10 years, really focused on uh, electrifying the fleet, right? That seems to be a really quick, really smart uh, move forward to address the climate. And that is all fine and dandy. It is really important work and we can extract all the efficiencies we can out of fuel, out of electric vehicles and, and fuel consumption. But in the end, we all know, and especially folks in this room, that 
we really actually ought to be thinking about vehicle miles traveled. But to get there, we're at a five year, maybe even 10 year lag in terms of where the conversation is for members of Congress. And so I think a really big goal in the idea of talking about how does the DOT reign in VMT, uh, we, first we got to talk to folks is what, what is VMT? And it's easy for me to understand that and for folks uh, on the call, but at the federal pol uh, political elected officials level, it's just not there. And so that's kind of the baseline first step that we're trying to do here in Congress. And the good news I have is that there are a growing number of members, including my boss, folks like champions like Ayanna Presley over in Massachusetts, who are really taking a step back, listening to experts and getting a better understanding of where we are. And you can see that smidgen of kind of breaking that, that concrete wall, if you will, or asphalt wall in that in the Invest Act in the past, uh, in just a few months ago, this summer, uh, the Invest Act, which then became part of HR2, the Moving Forward Act in Congress, it passed the House. It did not pass uh, Senator Mitch McConnell's desk in, over in the Senate, but it was a really clear demonstration that there are enough voices in Congress that we can start to crack this conversation. And I'll just highlight just a few pieces of what were in the House bill. One, we finally included a uh, measuring and tracking mechanism for greenhouse gas emissions, which is huge. Uh, taking the lead from states leading the way like California and to put that at the federal table, I can tell you first and foremost, that was that led to un, a million questions in the committee of what, what is this? How would states do this? How would my state do this? Um, and then we talk about level of service. And in fact, my, my boss, Congressman Garcia, introduced an amendment, which was ultimately, unfortunately, shot down, watered down. But es essentially, we said, look, we can't use level of service anymore at the federal level. Looking straight at SB 743 and said, how do we take this to the federal level and say, this widening of streets, speed as a metric is not a great measure of how you get people from point A to point B. Um, and in short, we, we were not able to overcome the political forces that said that is too much of a burden for states to figure out right now. And then all the, um, all the uh, industrial, industrial effects that that might have, the ripple effects. And really what that meant was big checks were flying in to say, that is a bad idea. We don't want that. If we want to have an asphalt business that's thriving, this sounds like we're going down a road that we don't want to go down. So all to say, and I'll keep it short because I do want to get to the discussion. I think it's keeping in mind that in this discussion about how we raise in, rein in VMT, we have to focus on where is Congress now? Because a lot of this money is going to come from the federal government and we'll have leaders like California and Minnesota. But what we really need to do is set that baseline. And I'm, I'm hopeful that a Biden administration can start to set those conversations and standards. But it really needs to come by convincing our colleagues because it's not just, and I say this, I can say this freely because I am partisan, I'm a Democrat, I work for a progressive Democrat. But um, it's not just our counterparts um, you know, who represent more rural areas, a lot of our members on the Republican side, it's also folks on, uh, on the Democratic side who really don't have an understanding that it's more than just electrifying the fleet. It's more than EV tax credits. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll sort of pause there um, and just, uh, again, thank everyone and really hope that I can lend some advice or some thoughts about how we move this at a federal level. In the end, I'm, I'm by far not an expert and it's really amazing to hear how this actually breaks down. And our job in Congress is to try to figure out how do we get that expertise uh, sort of through osmosis or through uh, banging on the doors of Congress to really get this message in and that we have a lot of work to do to rein in VMT. So I'll kick it to you, Eric, um, to kind of guide the, the rest of the conversation, but I'll, I'll jump off my soapbox there. Thank you, Don. Um, well, I have a list of questions that I believe to be awesome questions. There are questions that are of interest to me. Um, I bet you all have questions that would be more tailored to your own interests, so I encourage you to um, drop them in the chat and I'll, but until we get them, I'm going to start, uh, start that off. Um, so, um, as we've noted, DOTs have been um, oriented around reducing congestion. That's the whole LOS metric, you know, moving cars faster. Um, and honestly, it, you don't have to be an asphalt um, provider to 
not want to be stuck in traffic, right? People don't like it. And we have uh, in California and other states, lots of ballot measures aimed at uh, widening highways to because people are think that will help them uh, not be stuck in traffic. Um, so the question to you is, if we move to a VMT metric, do we abandon the whole congestion reduction effort? Um, do, does it mean people will have to deal with congestion? How do we how do we think about that and how do we talk about it? I mean, I have my own thoughts, but I wonder what Ellen and Don think about that. I'll, I'll sort of echo what Ellen said real quick and I'll kick it to Ellen, but I think that, I think the messaging is really important. In the end, it's there is a political element of how do we get this across to folks. And one, one deficiency I'd say that we have as a community who's trying to move this conversation forward is that unlike issues like immigration or criminal justice reform, there's not a really uh, key constituency to sort of weigh in from a, uh, like an organizational standpoint to, you know, as constituents to tell their members or other political leaders that this is a direction we want to go. And that, that's, that's a challenge is how do we build public sentiment for that? But Ellen mentioned it. I think one of the best things we can say is it's not about getting people out of their cars or saying, we, you know, we can't have cars anymore. It, it's really just as simple as we're trying to get people from point A to point B faster. And the question is, is the way that we calculate things now the most sensible? Does it actually achieve that goal? And it's, it's, it's just that simple. We're trying to get people from point A to point B in less time. And Ellen, LOS hasn't gone away completely in California, right? I mean, so congestion is still an issue. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to talk about congestion because people care about it and it does, um, you know, it is, there are negative impacts both in terms of people's daily lives and experiences, business impacts, economic impacts, environmental impacts. The issue is really knowing to what extent we actually can improve things in the ways we've tried to address congestion. Um, so I like to talk about giving people the opportunity to opt out of congestion. And one thing, you know, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, providing people with improvements to their communities so that they have choices other than driving, um, I, I really, I stay away from promising that a trip is going to be shorter or a trip is going to be even cheaper in some cases. But people, you know, should have the opportunity to say, I enjoy a, a walk commute or a bike commute or a bike and walk or a bike and transit or a scooter and transit commute. And um, it is more reliable for me in some cases, or it is just more uh, works for me better. And not only am I opting out of congestion, but I'm not creating, I'm not contributing to the congestion. So, you know, for me, that framing is helpful. Um, you know, there are some ways that we can reduce congestion in some situations. And I will say that one of the, you know, one of the kind of fascinating technical questions that people raise is like, oh, well, we're saying we're not going to build new facilities and add capacity because of VMT increase potential in some cases, or we're modifying our priorities. You know, but what about operational improvements? Uh, that are intended to, you know, basically kind of fix intersection operational issues. Like, isn't that effectively also adding capacity that might then generate additional trips? And the answer is, in my view, kind of yes and. And, and the and is yes, like examined in detail, you could say those are capacity increasing projects. And you can also uh, recognize the reality that People want the intersections in their communities to operate smoothly. And, you know, mid poorly timed signals are just going to aggravate people and make them hate these changes. So, you know, we have a system. We want to operate our system efficiently. We want to move people effectively and efficiently, uh, you know, with the amount of pavement we have. So there is a balancing act, but we can't turn away from congestion. People care about it. Um, I think I will just also say, I, I missed the session on COVID impacts, but I have been very interested in the research ongoing about remote working and the impacts remote working is going to have on VMT. And here's an area where I think we may see a divergence between VMT and congestion, because 
I think that when people work remotely, they are continuing to, to drive. However, they're less likely to drive in congested conditions because they don't like it. So I think when people have more discretion about when they drive, we're gonna have less peak hour congestion. So that's kind of an interesting little uh, side note. You know, broadly what we're trying to get away from is people saying we're adding a lane to solve congestion. And then we get, you know, public support for projects because of a stated aim that we actually can't achieve. Like that's the kind of negative cycle we want to really get away from. When we say, you know, approve this tax, we'll fund some highway widening and we'll reduce congestion. That has not ever been the experience um, that we've actually had over the long term. So that's what we're really trying to get away from. So I can. Oh, go ahead. I can. I just wanted to just touch base. You know, it's, I, I, I failed to mention this earlier, but Ellen, you touched on it right in the beginning when you said, you know, you can't make the promise that a, a transit or walking or bike ped uh, method is going to necessarily get someone quicker or be the easiest, but it, some folks will want to keep that. One, one thing that I wanted to, to posit too, and this is a conversation that my boss has sort of started and is planning to go a little further down the road on is this idea that uh, I know we, we said we'd steer away from the funding conversation, but part of that conversation is this the 80 20 split that we have with highways, transit, roads versus, uh, versus transit, 20 20 percent. And I think that that's that's a conversation my boss is now starting to have at a congressional level to say maybe we should look back at this formula that we've agreed to back as far as the 1920s. So does this really work? And what effects does that have in determining the viability of certain modes of transport? And so actually in a few days, my boss will introduce a resolution uh, with a lot of environmental groups to say, we should actually have funding equity prepared uh, for transit. Now that's, gonna, that's like the third rail of transportation. We're sure we're gonna get a lot of flack for that. But the idea being that we're all in, in the transit al alternative space, we are constantly fighting for tiny bits of dollars relative to roads. So the incentive for policymakers is that it's much easier to discuss and talk about putting in a extra lane because there's money for that. There's federal money sitting, waiting for that. It's set aside for that. But there isn't money in that way to say we should expand capital investment grants or that we should maybe, maybe putting down a rail line down this major thoroughfare would actually create less congestion or would actually help people get from point A to point B. So that's, that's just one piece is that we, I think that we want to start to be more bold about conversations about how do we address congestion um, that include transit and bike ped alternatives to say, look, if there was more money in this space and not just so many dollared incentives for more roads, more lanes, faster speeds, we might actually achieve the full outcome, which the public actually wants, which is less congestion, faster trips. So there's just a little piece there to add. Thank you. So uh, there was a question from Marie Venter about broadband and, and Ellen sort of touched on that about telecommuting. Um, Marie, did you want to, Ellen in, in a side note sort of suggested that uh, at least the telecommuting part isn't likely to reduce VMT so much as to shift where it, it occurs. But do you want to challenge that, Marie, or um, add to it? And uh, we're, if you're talking, we are not hearing you. Yeah, I'm sorry, it was a very, very faint sound, but not decipherable. Well, I can just, I'd be happy to make, just comment on the broadband. Sure, sorry, issue. Marie. Marie, I'm glad you raised this. So we uh, at Caltrans do have a role in broadband and we are working to, um, to become more active in terms of uh, installation of broadband within the right of way. We see it as a major equity issue in the state, an important way to support uh, rural areas and obviously you know, the present uh, environment in terms of schooling, remote working has just become more and more conspicuous. And actually uh, we have a great uh, model of some innovation in the broadband area in the Sacramento area uh, they are piloting using buses as uh, Wi-Fi hubs 
in some neighborhoods. So that's really exciting. Uh, but you know, this is an area that we're we're taking on, and people are raising the question: like, can this be mitigation for VMT impact? And it's really an area that we're still working to understand. But in terms of a DOT responsibility, yes, it is. It, it is part of what we're looking at, um, and it is definitely within our scope. It is a lot more affordable. More affordable. Sorry, I'm not sure. More affordable than driving. Um, Marie, if you want to elaborate on your point, yeah, more affordable than driving roads. Yes, it is. Um, absolutely. Could I follow up on something that Don said also on transit? I mean, I guess two points on transit. You know, one is that it's the operating expense, you know, that is all, all that is the other thing that really, really, you know, um, distinguishes the funding challenge on transit. But I think that, um, you know, part of the reason that people clamor for more roads is that it's really a pretty small proportion of our population nationally that has ever lived in an environment where they're really well served by transit. And so it's not in people's frame of reference as, you know, here's an effective way to get around that's going to meet my needs. Um, and, you know, while I think part of our challenge always is to um, kind of be realistic about the large swaths of the country and of our population that doesn't have that experience while also recognizing that the densest parts of our densest downtowns uh, exist only because of transit. So, you know, like the essential nature of, of transit in downtown Chicago, lower Manhattan, San Francisco, uh, Philadelphia, you know, the places that have rail networks where there is a traditional center, you know, that have to be supported by transit um, are just so different from the places where so many, you know, so many people live where um, no one is riding transit except for a transit dependent population because it does not provide a good service. So that's a good sign. It's self-perpetuating, it, it's this perpetuating system is that we, we bake this formula and as a result, the built environment, you know, I grew up in, in really, you know, wide avenue to suburbia and the idea of taking a bus was crazy. I had to wait 45 minutes for a bus to get nowhere. Um, but I think that's part of it is how do we break that system? Otherwise we kind of find ourselves continuing down the road of the same suburbans probably we've always had. Right. And so that, the, that conversation kind of segues into a couple of questions that came from um, Joe and Bill here about uh, sort of a, you know, one size fits all approach. We, state DOTs have to be responsible for the whole state, but there are large parts that w just won't be served by transit except for maybe paratransit and s safety net type transit, but not daily commuting type transit in a real way. Joe, do you want to, you want to ask your, unmute and ask your question? Sure. Hi, hi, everybody. Joe Segali from Vermont. Um, yeah, I've just been thinking about like what's what's our message to our rural folks about vehicle miles traveled, and you know because I, I think most people that live in rural areas don't see the evils of driving. They they really they see the benefits of it, and it's it's really what provides us with accessibility. Um, and I, I think you know it's I think we do a pretty good job job in Vermont of providing transit in rural areas and doing some other, you know, a bike pad and those sorts of improvements that are very localized. But I just, um, you know, if the goal is to re re reduce vehicle miles traveled and maybe that sort of points a direction towards improvements that don't benefit rural areas, how do we, how do we explain, you know, what the benefits are, at least from a transportation perspective? I think there's obviously the reduction of greenhouse gases is a great goal <laughs> and maybe that's even more important, but just wondering in California, because there's, you, you know, you have, probably more rural area than, than in the whole state of Vermont. So you probably had to kind of deal with this question to some extent. Um, yeah, we could just tuck Vermont into Northeastern California. <laughs> uh, but actually I have some familiarity with Vermont and there are some really strong similarities because, you know, a number of our rural areas, like I would say areas throughout New England experience a lot of um, weekend and holiday season congestion. 
And, you know, the tourism economy is very strong, right? You have places that are, um, you know, have a, a strong tourist economy, a str right? Strong visitor economy, maybe a strong agriculture economy. And the ability of people to get around is critical. Um, so, but that said, even though the VMT is a very small, you know, proportion in California of the statewide VMT, or if you looked at, you know, the Northeast broadly, right, the rural areas would have a very small, um, right. make a very small contribution. I, I think that it's still a helpful way to consider the wisdom of improve of network improvements and capacity improvements. There are issues associated with rural sprawl. We do see disinvested older communities when it becomes easy for new subdivisions, yeah. retirement communities. We have isolation, you know, social and physical isolation to be concerned about. And I think in a lot of our rural areas, a concern that I have is growing VMT associated with, you know, closure of hospitals, closure of services so that people have to travel more. So, it is a complicated bundle of questions. I guess what I'm getting at is I don't have the answer, but I think it's useful to use VMT as one way to, to think about these questions and, and making investments. And that the, the, the need to support places people are, are already invested in, I think is really important as well as to maintain the natural resource base in, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in, in all our states, but our states that are, are renowned for their natural beauty. So to you. jump in on that, Joe, I think um, I really appreciate you asking this question because this is certainly a point of debate uh, in, in the House, I'm sure in the Senate as well. I think one of the, just taking it, and I don't know that I have the perfect example or perfect answer, but I think taking one step back is the question was, you know, how do you convince folks that reducing BMT is a good thing? I think one of the first steps we have to take, at least at the federal level, is even measuring VMT um, and why that might have some benefits. And I think part of the discussion we've had, at least on the uh, Ways and Means Committee, which does sort of tax revenue, is the idea of looking at the Highway Trust Fund to say, um, here, here's a reason why we should at least measure VMT, uh, in that the fuels tax has not been the most uh, accurate, as now we have more fuel efficient vehicles, we have more electric vehicles, uh, it does not really fund itself anymore. So we've seen over $143 billion already been moved over from the general fund to fund the highway trust fund. So that shortfall alone, I think, is an argument to say that we ought to find a new metric period to measure sort of traveling. So, it, the, you know, the, the argument that the fuels tax is a user fee, it's not quite a user fee anymore because everyone pays into it. Uh, even if you're not driving, you're $143 billion in taxes that went to it anyways. So all, all to say, I don't know that I have the answer about how you can convince folks that you have to measure VMT in rural areas. That's, that's a more complicated question, but I certainly think that there is an argument to made for anybody that uh, we at least need to move to start measuring VMT. And I think that's, that's a challenge in of itself too. I mean, I want to add a little bit on that from our experience here in Wisconsin. I mean, I think Ellen's point about Ex, what's really rural? Is it a small town? Is it exurbia where, you know, sprawl type considerations actually come into play? Um, but if it's truly rural, what we, you know, where farm to market roads are the main um, mode of transportation, um, those aren't causing the, the induced demand. I mean, that's like, you could just kind of like write that off and say, you don't have to, that's not a problem. For one thing, we're not adding capacity to farm to market roads, where it's more about the condition of them. Do they go back to gravel or do, do they get resurfaced adequately? Do they get plowed in the winter? And um, one of the big issues with that, of course, is all the money going into capacity in our case in metropolitan Milwaukee or Madison and places like that. We have these billion dollar interchange projects um, that that come out of the same pot that might go into um, money going back to the local townships to keep the farm to markets up. So that's one way that I think about it is like I would I would almost hold harmless certain kinds of projects so that you know your, your town's association um, doesn't feel like you're coming for them because you're not. It's not, it doesn't matter. Um, Bill, you had um, a related question there and maybe we've touched on, you know, what you were getting at there, but uh, you wanna throw in on this? 
Yeah, yeah, that, that was a really good discussion. And I, I like Joe's questions and, and Ellen, your perspective and, and Don, your perspective on that. Um, I, I guess just like how important are state targets? You know, I'm, I'm coming at this from an, an advocacy organization perspective uh, based in the Washington DC area, with the, the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Um, but we also look at issues statewide, you know, with respect to legislation that, that affects our, our metro areas. And, um, you, you know, Don, you make a great point that first we got to start measuring it. And there's a lot of good reasons for that beyond just climate. So we just, just want to hear the perspective on, you know, how, how valuable are, will state targets be? And are, what, what are some places we should look at um, besides California? You know, Washington State has some targets. Um, but would like like to hear your thoughts on that. Is there a call on someone? Uh, I guess, <laughs> okay. Ellen, you look like you're about to, to speak. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I do want to clarify. So we don't have a specific VMT target. Uh, and, you know, to me, I, I, I would say that what would be really helpful is some kind of baseline, like a directional target. Like what Eric was saying, do you want to go up or down? Like, oh, we don't know that. Like, we should know that. So I think some kind of um, indicators are helpful. I think fussing over, you know, tiny detail, less helpful. Um, and I think also like the targets are very challenging with VMT because of course the, the travel is actually connecting places. So, you know, the idea of trying to say, well, you know, whose VMT is this is just persistently challenging if you start trying to break places up. Um, I think understanding the places or the kinds of trips that you're going to see growth in and that you need to plan for growth in and that are productive in terms of economic growth, et cetera, versus um, additional travel, you know, because of hospital closures or the loss of job opportunities. Um, and so I think there are really strong tie-ins with the idea of using accessibility metrics. Um, you know, I, I don't think that statewide VM tar VMT targets, uh, to me, it, it's not something that it seems like we're ready for technically or that are a next step versus the idea of let's bring VMT down or let's recognize that there are people who don't have access uh, to the places they need to go and that there are some communities and some households that should be moving more and that that are don't have a high enough vmt right so you know just a sort of a more um stratified uh kind of a little more slicing and dicing i think is helpful in terms of understanding our people and our communities and you know we want to work against isolation and towards accessibility and in a lot of cases that can be done with less travel and in some cases more travel. Yeah, I would just echo what Ellen said. I think it's hard to, to speak at a statewide level, but I think directionally that that's, you know, again, the step back is that folks didn't even know what direction we should head in. So I think that, I think having a directional goal is key. And I really do think that, and my hope is that a new administration can kind of start to pave the way in into moving both the, the national DOT, but also other DOTs in that same direction by setting, uh, you know, goal standards uh, down the road. You know, I think now is a really maybe a good time to mention the goods movement issue also. You know, uh, California, the, the, the state highway system is very, very heavily impacted by the level of goods movement, you know, much of which is from the West Coast ports to elsewhere in the country. And you know, it's a very lively debate about the benefits that are afforded to people in the state and the state economy from the amount of uh, goods movement, warehousing, distribution activity in the state. So it, you know, that's, another, that's another area where we could just use some smarter thinking on what are we trying to get to? What's realistic and how can we um, you know, how can we address this enormous demand that is very much, you know, a weight in favor of additional highway capacity, I would say broadly. So that, you know, that's another piece of the, of the puzzle. In 743, we're talking about passenger transportation, but when we're actually debating investments, we're often talking about goods movement. Mm -hmm. 
great, very helpful perspective. Thanks. And I, I'll just, uh, I was sort of a participant in some of the California, um, the strategic management plan that Ellen mentioned. That was even before she came to Caltrans and I can validate the notion that it was a great goal, but I'd much rather have this, these rules that affect individual projects and actual decisions than a high level goal that says we're gonna make you know X amount of reduction over X number of years. And I think even the, the vaunted SB 375, which tries to do that it, by region in California is, is having some real trouble because the goals get, you know, how do you project forward uh, what we're gonna do? You know, that gets into the whole modeling and it can easily be gamed. Um, and it also gets into a question that popped into the, because all things are, are connected here that just popped into the to the chat from Gail Hoffman because one of the problems that SB 375 has run into is that uh, people have responsibilities for BMT reduction but not necessarily the authority to deal with certain things including land use. G Gail, maybe you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, my, um, I don't think that Colorado is unusual but Colorado, uh, land use is something that local governments jealously guard. It's in state statute. There have been attempts in the past to make land use, you know, maybe certain kinds of land use a state issue, and those have been shot down. So um, right now we have a governor who's really intent, or he would like to see us reduce a BMT. Uh, and certainly the greenhouse gas, but it's being done um, like there's a thought that somehow you can measure the greenhouse gas or a certain project might produce. So the, the question is, um, what do either of you have any um, advice to give? Because yes, we do have to reduce greenhouse gas. How do we do that if we can't control land use? By we, I mean the state, not necessarily the DOT. John, yeah, so, you want to start this one? Yeah, sure. It's at, so I'm really glad you asked this question, Gail, because this is a question that um, my boss encountered on a slightly different topic, but it really does touch on the same thing, which is we were trying to figure out how do you get more transit-oriented development. And in some ways, that, that does help reduce VMT, getting folks who live closer to the where they, in denser areas with closer access to transit. And I think that's one of the main things we hit was that there was this idea that you actually can't determine from a federal level land use. And I think this may be the same response for state level, but what we have tried to do is get more innovate one to help people understand that that is an issue that not having that land use uh, sort of having the ability to affect land use is, was an issue uh, to achieve sort of the federal goals. And so what we tried to do was reorient existing federal dollars, whether that's grants, formulas and adding criteria that would be favorable in this case for uh, transit-oriented development projects that kind of met some affordability uh, requirements for housing. And so in the same vein, I think that one can do that at the state or federal level to start to um, tie up existing funds so that they start to hit certain targets or move in a certain direction. One, one case being if, if we had passed HR2, there would have been a greenhouse gas emission metric by project and also had my boss's amendment to uh, sort of create a induced demand metric, uh, sort of move away from level of service and say project by project, you need to be able to demonstrate what is the induced demand caused by said project. If, if those sort of ideas can be baked into existing criterion for funding, you can sort of start to create the incentives to affect land use. You may not be able to designate, but you can have uh, an incentive, incentives-based um, effect on how we use, uh, how we do infill. So I think, um, you know, there's so many pieces of this to, to unpack. So one uh, thing I always like to, <laughs> to make sure to go on the record with is that uh, the challenge is, is even more than states not having land use control. So even the local agencies that have land use control in terms of regulation, 
still are often, um, you know, come up short in terms of actually having the regulatory power to drive uh, development because it's the private development market that is driving these decisions. And we can want certain things to happen for even from a local government point of view. Um, that doesn't mean they happen. So, uh, you know, working with the the private market and using the public uh, levers that we have to help shape that is a challenge that sometimes we're good at and sometimes we're not so good at. Um, but I think that, you know, a key piece that we really haven't tuned up yet is having um, correct costs assigned to private development uh, that accurately reflect the public burden of development uh, in areas that are at the urban edge, at the urban fringe. And, you know, one of our biggest problems from the perspective of, you know, a smart growth approach is that from the developer's perspective, and I think in almost, every, almost everywhere in the country, it is less expensive to develop on green fields, to develop in outlying areas than it is to redevelop. And it's for a whole bunch of reasons and capturing those reasons uh, and capturing what is in fact the public benefit of reinvestment so that it becomes less expensive. That to me is one of the central challenges uh, for the public side. Uh, the one other thing, which is kind of one of my other favorite rants um, that I, I just wish I had time to dive into and maybe one of you has some incredibly clever intern that can dry, dive into this. You know, we say we don't have land use we don't have land use power as DOTs. And it's, of course it's true, right? We're not land use regulators. But if you look, if you, if you look at, a, uh, at an aerial photograph and you took the highway facilities out and you just looked at the development pattern, you would be able to see where every, every freeway facility was. You can, you, we have an enormous influence on land use. Uh, we're not regulators, but our influence is absolutely tremendous. And if we wielded that uh, more wisely, I think we could make a big difference. Yeah, I, we've, this is something that SSTI works on a lot. So I just want to say just in about a minute that we have developed a lot of work around a, a, a lot of um, pr products and thinking around accessibility, which brings together the networks and, you know, the facilities and the land uses and to one decision-making um, platform. Um, this is in use in some places already, including by transportation agencies. So, for example, Virginia DOT scores projects based on land use, and it's based on an accessibility metric that we help them develop. So, um, like Ellen said, um, we can either continue down the vicious cycle of uh, widening to uh, accommodate sprawl, which generates more sprawl, which, you know, causes more widening, or we can um, recognize that we as in transportation world and our decisions are, are doing that and, and take steps. And um, so that would, we could go on and on about that, but um, one very simple thing is that um, state DOTs run a lot of arterials that aren't very livable, and if they were slower moving, or easier to cross or less noisy, then they might be better places to live and people might, you might have some, you might encourage some development that is now being pushed out into uh, the exurban parts. So lots of things that, you know, the, the, it, is, it is definitely something like the induced demand that DOTs have not really tried to grapple with traditionally, but that doesn't mean that we can't and shouldn't and aren't in some cases. So um, great question. Thank you for, um, for bringing that up. Um, Carrie, you had a question um, around what DOTs, again, could do about something that they haven't necessarily um, seen as central in the past around parking. Do you want to unmute and pose your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I pose that question because I think I think Ellen said that most Americans haven't had a good experience with public transportation. And, and when I think about that, I think that's true. Um, and when I think about my experiences, my being forced to use public transportation because of high parking prices 
ha is also uh, correlated with a good a good experience with public tr transportation. So just kind of wondering what approaches that Caltrans is taking in that regard and how, you're, how you or are not incorporating that into your strategy. And then of course the equity, you know, anytime we raise costs, um, people are disproportionately impacted. So how do you address that? Uh, so Carrie, you're, you're touching on several areas that we're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of wrangling with right now. So uh, parking specifically, we don't get into directly very much, right? Because the, the, you know, generally we're talking either about municipally owned parking or private parking. But we have more broadly started to have conversations about using pricing as part of a suite of measures to influence behavioral decisions. And even that is, is new. Um, so we have a, um, a committee of our executive board that addresses managed lanes and tolling and that committee, so that's a committee of Caltrans leadership and they've been supported by a staff committee. And this is just a very sort of practical answer to, to I think maybe it's useful for folks to get an example of, you know, well, how do you start addressing things, right, differently than you have before? So we have this executive committee and they've been supported by a staff committee that has very much been focused on the operational aspects of tolling. Well, now we have a second staff committee supporting our executives to talk about pricing, focused on the behavioral sides of pricing. And that group is doing things like, you know, bringing stories of what's going on internationally, bringing information about what some of our local partners are doing on parking or in San Francisco and LA, you know, the conversations ongoing about cordon pricing schemes or all these different approaches. So now when we talk about pricing, we're sort of newly talking about this continuum of different pricing strategies that, you know, there's a whole set of strategies and that are um, opportunities to do tolling, you know, is part of this package and this broader landscape of, of pricing approaches. And I think there's a, a growing sophistication about that. Um, on the equity side, uh, specifically on pricing, so we have funded a number of partner studies that are looking specifically at this issue, and this is the focus of some of the work going on in San Francisco now. Um, and then when we look at, at, at facility pricing, uh, for example, we've just been looking at this in the context of our statewide transportation plan. And part of that uh, exercise has involved looking at different scenarios from the point of view of an equity perspective and you know what if you just assume that um, the lowest income quintile doesn't pay any tolls when others are paying tolls or so we're kind of looking at those scenarios and I think it is at this point kind of very much one of the, uh, the primary considerations as we look at these different strategies. Okay. Um. Unless, Don, did you have anything to add? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I, don't, I, I can't speak a ton on the federal level about parking that we, we don't get too involved on in the parking piece, but I do want to just touch on that since we, I'm really glad you brought up Carrie and Ellen, but the idea of equity, I think we can't remove the, the, the component of equity in any conversation about VMT reduction, right? Because I think what isn't highlighted enough is the reliance that uh, communities of color, frontline workers, especially because they're disproportionately uh, represented, um, are, are folks who rely on transit and who don't have the ability to afford to have a car, let alone travel the distances that in some cases folks are asked to travel. So we know that workers of color are overrepresented in the folks who travel over a 60 minute commute. And we know that the cost of owning a car can be upwards of $8,000 a year. And that alone is a reason why we have to rethink just both our land use, um, but also our access, uh, and really rethink about the metrics about how we get people from point A to point B. And a core component of that, as we've talked about today, is, is VMT reduction, is how do you close in those distances and give people alternatives? Um, and that goes back to the, my earlier comments about how we fund and how we really think about the ultimate goal, which is how do you get people to drive less, as Alan would say, and to get from point A to point B in the safest and accessible way. Yeah, and I, I would just uh, to 
promote another SSTI product. We have a report that came out last year called Modernizing Mitigation. Um, and that is a place where, S where DOTs do directly touch the whole um, parking situation. Um, we tend to impose mitigation requirements on developments that um, add capacity to handle the new traffic they're gonna generate. And that's one of the things that SB 743 on the land use side tried to un undo. And so we tried to generalize some of the learnings from SB 743 and other, other TDM related mitigation efforts um, into this one report. And so it tries to, um, to, to flip the script again, to suggest that um, less is more. And if, if, we, can, if we can get a, a new development that has less parking and makes less burden on the system and less VMT, that's a win for everybody. And that's what we should be pushing for rather than just um, getting them to kick in more money to widen the roads and, and speed, speed up traffic. So, um, so that all these things do intersect. And um, um, so uh, I would just point you guys to that if that's of interest. And it, it certainly has an equity component in that um, if we do traditional mitigation, which is very auto-oriented, it, um, as has been said, um, excludes people who can't drive and, you know, is, is, is very bad in that way. Um, I'm sorry, I'm multitasking and looking at the chat and trying to make sense and say things too. And we're, uh, I, there was a question that was um, way back upstream and it was around something that I kind of referred to at the beginning when, when DOTs were looking at VMT as a good thing Part of that was because of the revenue that comes from gas taxes. And even if we shift to a VMT fee, that's even a more direct link between revenue coming into the agency and people driving more. So um, Don and Ellen, I wonder if there's a, if you've thought about untangling this question of, um, you know, we get paid to do the wrong thing in a way in transportation world by, you know, allowing more driving. Go, go ahead, Alan, if you want to jump in. <laughs> that was just a lot bundled up. So um, on the, I think part of the question was about the, the re our revenue being tied to VMT. I think, um, you know, there is, there is a logic to it. I think that, you know, the shift that we're actually looking at is towards VMT-based charging um, you know, away from the gas tax charge. So that is getting at the uh, increased efficiency of conventional vehicles is one of the reasons that the gas tax isn't, isn't keeping up, keeping pace with the cost of maintaining our system. And then in, uh, in California in particular, the increased uh, share of um, vehicles in the fleet that are, um, that are zero emission or low emission vehicles also. So, you know, we are, we and a number of other states are studying uh, options for a road user charge. And that road user charge is really a substitute for the gas tax. So it's not connected with the behavioral issues. And these things are really being dealt with separately. And um, I know that's really bothersome to some people that we're not sort of looking at an integrated approach that would um, take all of our various policy aims into account. Uh, but I would say the the sensitivity around uh, a shift away from the gas tax as our basic revenue stream for system maintenance, asset management, um, you know, that is considered kind of so sacrosanct that it's like that's in its own, in its own, you know, bubble. Um, and that's the road user charge discussion. And the road user charge discussion is very much separate from the pricing discussions. Um, and, and that's how it, <laughs> and that's how it is. <laughs> at this time. So to that, to that point, I actually think something that my boss has been kind of honing in on, and I think others have, uh, other, uh, other progressive members in the Congress have been sort of begging the question of why are we locked into a zero-sum game? Right? Number one, about this question of being in this box mm -hmm. that we must operate within the revenue that we raise, and that somehow the highway trust fund and fuels tax is, is working. And I think that's the I mentioned it earlier, but in the end, we're actually pulling money from other tax tax paying um, methods. 
outside of the user feed because it already doesn't work. And so that's one reason that we ought to look at that. And that's, that trend will only continue as we start to get more fuel efficient vehicles. And then the other piece is um, kind of, I'm kind of losing my chain of thought here, but I think uh, you added a lot in that question, Eric, but I think a lot of it is really looking at it and, and not putting ourselves in the box of a zero sum game that we have to do that this is, it's this or that, and this is the one amount of money that we have, because we already don't operate within that box of money. We, we pull money from other sources as it is. Okay. Okay, thanks. So we're, we're at an hour and a half and people are gonna, that's maybe people are gonna start to um, drop off because that 90 minutes is kind of a, the long, the long side of a Zoom call, but there is still an, another question here from Joe. So I'm, I, let, let's keep going as long as people are interested. Um, Joe, you wanna, it's a simple question. I can just read it, but if you have more to say, you wanna. No, go ahead, yeah. Can, <laughs> yeah. So how have developers reacted to the change in DMT that we were alluding to uh, on the SP743 side? And um, uh, we've done work with, with uh, cities on this, so I could speak to it, but I don't know, Alan, you you live there and you have done more with it and you have the, so why don't you start? Uh, sure, I would say the, the most important answer is it depends on what kind of developers. So um, the way that um, the change influences land development is to identify the fact that there are areas that operate efficiently and that are low VMT areas, and these are primarily infill areas, not just in our big cities, but also you know, in a lot of, of the established towns and cities across the state that operate more efficiently than outlying areas. Um, and in these areas, there is essentially a, um, what's that phrase? Get out of jail free card. I shouldn't say that, it's a very bad metaphor. Don't forget that. Just forget that whole reference to jail. Um, so, but there is essentially uh, a way of saying, okay, well, your project is not going to have a transportation impact under CEQA by virtue of its location. You are adding activity in an area that already operates effic more efficiently than most places in the states, go do. So uh, the developers that do that kind of development are quite enthusiastic about this. Uh, the master plan developers that are doing more of uh, you know, the production builders, I think, you know, much more um, commonly are, you know, really trying to understand the impact. I, I certainly wouldn't say, you know, they're all against this. They're, it's still very early days. And I would say the, the concern is more about uncertainty than it is just an outright opposition. It's like, well, how will this affect this? Is it because they've been paying transportation mitigation under the old rules. Uh, transportation has been a, a big, a big uh, part of their on-site and off-site expenses. So I think the jury's out. There's a lot of concern. They're concerned about lack of um, established precedent about the procedures. And I think uh, very much a, a to be determined. Wary maybe is a fair way to describe the current, uh, the current attitude. Thank yeah. you. And we're, we're in Madison trying to implement something similar to what is happening under SB 743. You don't need CEQA to do it. You can do it under other sorts of authority. Um, we would be doing it under our zoning authority. So we already have TDM requirements. They're very uh, amorphous and it relies on transportation engineering having a long conversation with you and then going before various boards and committees and having that conversation. And it can be fraught and you could get a yes from one person and a no from another. And so, um, as Ellen said, the, the, so the infill developers are pretty enthusiastic from the get-go. The sprawl developers, say what they are, um, less ex excited, but everybody's excited about the prospect of more transparency and certainty in the process. Of course, like there, there's uncertainty in like what this is all gonna be. So, but once getting over that hump, if you can go to a website and um, satisfy your mitigation requirements in a half an hour by checking boxes for things that you're gonna be able to do compared to all these back and forth that they have to do now, that's a win. So. It's, um, you know, it's a process and uh, 
not everybody's super happy, but um, it's also not like everybody's out with pitchforks to, to stop it. Yeah. I can't speak too much to the point we, I, you know, it's not something we've done necessarily uh, in Chicago, but also that we, we don't typically talk to developers directly at our level. But um, I think that just the one takeaway is I don't think we're ever going to make everyone happy. I think the, what should be the guiding principle is, is good policy and good outcomes. So. so I had one last question on my list and maybe it'll be pretty quick, but obviously it could unpack into hours and hours, but, um, and it's, it's, it could be for both of you, but, uh, but Don, I uh, would start with you. Like we didn't get the changeover in the Congress that we were thinking we might. And so the bill that you described, may not still yet at least. No, we, okay. So yeah, it's still up in the air. Um, um, but we are going to have a new administration, even though some people seem to still be denying that. Um, what role do you see there? And you've already touched a little bit on this, but um, what role do you see on the administration side for moving some of this forward? And you know, if you had the transition team here right now, what would you be talking to them about? I mean, it's a lot of the stuff that you saw in HR2 and also a lot of the discussion we've had here, which is that there's so much work that can be done outside of just changing the law. It's changing the direction and the guidance of DOT. So whether it's re-looking or providing new guidance on how level of service is used or looking at uh, a greenhouse gas metric, these are things that don't require the law that are, could be given as guidance. A lot of this is folks have mentioned this on the technical assistance. There's a lot of folks in smaller cities and municipalities who want to know how to move the dial forward, but don't necessarily have that guidance or those tools. And I think that is a huge piece that the administration can drive forward, bridging the gap uh, between you know, EPA's sort of goals and how DOT plays into that. Um, I think those are, those are some of the key, key pieces and just moving the conversation away from where we've been. Um, and focusing on outcomes and really lifting up the argument about equity, right? That has to be a core piece. And that's certainly a piece that my boss will push this administration to do, which is that this, I said it earlier, there's not a really strong constituency out there you can target and say, hey, you should care about VMT or you should care about greenhouse gas reductions in transportation or, you know, you should care about more transit funding. But that's something that we're working on doing. That's certainly something that the leadership of an administration can, can build up is an understanding that part of that base in the same way that it's for criminal justice reform or immigration is that it's an equity piece. Folks, there are millions and millions of Americans who are not satisfied or who are underserved or disserviced by the existing built environment. And that if we don't make those changes now, we're gonna be where we were in the 1920s, 100 years from now doing the exact same thing with even more sprawl. So I think that's kind of the conversation we hope to have. And you know, who knows, maybe we'll have a DOT secretary like Ellen or, or Beth Osborne who's on the call. Or we, you know, we'll have, the hope is that we'll have someone who unlike our current secretary will be interested in actually moving in this direction and open to these ideas in the same way that we're hoping will be convincing hearts and minds in the House to continue some of the efforts and in the Senate. Thanks. Ellen, any thoughts on the administration? I think, I think Don's comments were really apt and I, I agree that there are, there are a lot of, of pieces and, and levers that can be moved without, you know, or at least I don't want to say that can be moved, that may be able to be moved. Uh, you know, without uh, necessarily engaging in the the big battles. Um, and Eric, I think you you mentioned something earlier. It relates to what Don is saying um, about the arterials that are in our state highway systems. And you know, I think one of the things we could do that really would address a lot of our um, both our equity issues and our challenges around attracting infill development is to direct more of our funding to the improvement of our conventional state highways so they become more welcoming for investment and to start to, you know, really looking at the package of improvements to the whole right of way so that we're talking about landscaping and drainage and bike and pet accommodation and the travel way um, together and really investing in communities. One of the things I've started uh, to say 
uh, that I, I find amazing how no one has taken issue with. Um, you know, if you, you just say to people, hey, if I show you a picture of a street, I bet you're going to be able to tell me uh, something about the income level that live around that, the people that live around that street. And, you know, it is just consistently true that the level of investment in our public right of way is influenced by who lives there. And if we try to wipe that out, um, to me, that would be a, a very, you know, a very proud accomplishment, even just directing our attention to that. So there's a lot of ways we can talk about investing in our system that are different than what we've been doing uh, in a way that I don't think, you know, have to feel like they're divisive politically. Uh, you know, Eric, on that point, I think one of the best things that a Biden administration or transition team can do is create a task force, right? We all know that the country needs a massive infrastructure investment, upwards of, you know, 1.5 trillion. And that's sort of separate from the, the relief that we need for COVID. But I think that one of the best things that the administration can do is really pull together thought leaders, uh, leaders in different state DOTs, um, uh, and around the country in, in different organizations to, to say, look, we need to sit at the table and say, what, what do we need to hash out now? So what we don't do is just perpetuate the issues that we had. You know, it, it's easy to throw $1.5 trillion. We did that with uh, ARA, which, you know, I did as a, as a young person kind of at the city of Los Angeles, where it was all about shovel ready, get it, get it out and done, get the money flowing. But we didn't actually do any policy. We didn't really think about what we did. We just wanted money out, wanted jobs. But in the end, We've just perpetuated this. And I think that's one of the best things we could do is pull together thought leaders, folks like at Caltrans, at Minnesota, at MnDOT, VA.DOT, organizations like Transportation for America, Smart Growth, other groups out there, Sustainable Streets, to say, look, what, what, are, what should we be looking at in a new DOT um, if, we can only, if we only have four years? Maybe we have eight, but I think the goal is how do we really shift the direction? Great. Great place to, to start to wrap this up. And I, before we do, I do want to recognize um, Victoria Sheehan, who um, has been a longtime member and participant in um, our community of practice as a CEO from the great state of New Hampshire, um, and has just is just uh, taking over as president of Ashto now. So uh, Victoria, thank you for sticking out this whole, uh, I think you're the only CEO who's stuck it out through the whole hour and 45 minutes of the session. Um, so uh, we're really glad that, uh, that you did. Um, not to put you on the spot, but either as a CEO or as the, in your Ashdale role, do you have any reflections or thoughts on what you've heard today? Well, either Victoria has stepped away or has no thoughts or can't unmute. Okay, anyway, I uh, wanted to recognize Victoria. She's been great in, as an SSTI participant for, for many years and we're excited to have her um, at the helm of Ashto. Um, so look forward to the conversations with her as well. Um, so um, I think we have had a great conversation today, um, covered a lot of ground, um, obviously could unpack a lot of this stuff for hours and hours in other ways, and do encourage everybody to reach out to us if you want to do that. Um, we'll again be posting the recording so you can forward it to your colleagues um, and other links and stuff at ssti.us, which um, you should, should be a great resource to you. Sign up for our blog. Don't be a stranger. Um, Let's keep in touch. Thanks again to Don. Thanks again to Ellen. Great work. Really appreciate it. Um, and with that, let's call it a day. Thank you Thanks so much, everybody. Eric. Thanks, great Ellen. Conversation. This was Bye. Great. Thank you.